I'm Kelly Hill, technology reporter for RCR Wireless News. Thank you for joining me. Let's start off with some of this week's news. Alcatel Lucent stock was up this week as it made progress on increasing revenues and announced a partnership with Qualcomm on small cells for residential and enterprise deployments. The company continues to execute on what it calls the shift plan to transition from a telecom equipment generalist to a company focused on IP networking and super fast broadband for mobile and fixed networks. Nokia Siemens said it has successfully tested voice over LTE and other IMS services in a virtualized core network environment using commercial off-the-shelf hardware and its OSS product along with cloud management app, uh, with cloud application management. You can read these stories and more at rcrwireless.com. Now on to our guest interview. Steve Garrison is Vice President of Product Management at P uh, um, excuse me, Vice President of Product Management at Peak 8, which specializes in software defined networking. Welcome Steve. Hey, Kelly, it's great to be on Hangout. Thanks for asking us to join. Great. Um, can you start off by telling us a little bit about Pika 8 and what you folks do? Sure. We're one of uh, many new startups pushing the envelope on a couple of dimensions. We kind of captured the idea in, in something called open networking. It plays into software-defined networking, but it also plays into the transition that we see in the industry moving from a vertically integrated system to a horizontally integrated system. And what I mean by that is if you look back 10 years ago when mainframes were starting to be challenged by the personal computer, mainframe industry was built vertically. You had your own system, ASICs, middleware, software and applications all tied together in one system. It was guaranteed the work, but it was closed. You couldn't customize it or personalize it, and, and you were really tied to that vendor for all the applications that they proved out on their platform. The PC industry started the idea that I buy the metal or the substrate or the PC itself from one vendor. I buy multiple operating systems. Uh, I choose that. I choose the applications I run, and hence the idea of personal computer. We think that's moving to the network side. And what we mean by that is just like in servers and just like in storage, you can buy white box switches today. You can put your own operating system on those switches, and you can start to do development of applications that mean something to your application environment that really attack your pain points. Not everybody's pain point, but your pain point. So we think there's a trend towards personal networking, leveraging the new economics of white boxes so you save some money, and we're giving people freedom to really start to customize the network fabric for what they're trying to achieve in their business. Okay. Um, Software-defined networking, or SDN, um, it's been a yep. really hot topic this year in telecom, um, but there seem to be a lot of different perspectives on exactly how to define it. Um, so yeah. how do you define SDN? It, it's a great question, and I think the answer changes almost weekly, Kelly, based on what new announcements come out. So we definitely feel the uh, frustration of readers and, and also customers. In fact, sometimes when we walk into a meeting, the customer says, if this, if this uh, meeting's about SDN, I'm leaving. <laughs> so we, we're very careful to make sure we understand what the pain of the customer is, why they wanted to meet with, with us. And in frank, frankness, that's why we leverage the open networking story around the economics uh, angle is how can you save money in switching right out as, as another angle. But to us, SDN really is trying to attack a problem of moving things. And there's really two buckets or two camps. If you're in the data center and you're trying to move virtual machines and you have a lot of virtual machines, that's one issue. Today, you can point and click and spin up virtual machines within seconds. You can move those virtual machines within localized areas very effectively using the existing commercial tools that are out there. Uh-oh, if you want to move that virtual machine between network domains or network VLANs, now you have to have a manual process come in and that's why there's so much focus on trying to fix that piece of networking. The second camp is on the service provider side where you're moving things again, circuits or flows. If you're trying to move video streams or make sure you manage those streams in a more efficient way without truck rolls, without manual provisioning practices, or you're trying to put up a new circuit or turn on a new service for a customer in seconds, not minutes, days, hours, or weeks. It's, again, it's an OPEX play and how to do things better, faster, cheaper from the network side. So we're working with customers in both camps, both data center customers and service provider customers, and we're really trying to help them figure out how to create a service faster, uh, create it with lower cost, and fundamentally make it easier to manage so that we reduce their OPEX over time. 
Um, kind of following up on that, do you see there's there's SDN and then kind of under that umbrella is uh, is network function network function virtualization or NFV. Now, do you folks see that as yeah. as part of a whole or as different or as different from each other? Yeah, sadly, it's getting very religious out there right now, Kelly. And in fact, uh, what's really challenging, and again, this is creating a lot of confusion in the market, is that lo and behold, a lot of legacy companies, as I call them all decided to whitewash their houses with SDN messaging last year, so it's getting really difficult. Furthermore, there's another acronym you didn't put in there called NV. So there's network virtualization, NV. There's N NFV, network function virtualization, and there's the umbrella trend of SDN. Some people believe these are all truly disparate functions and they're not related. If you abstract it, though, in my humble opinion, to the 100,000-foot layer, we're trying to still solve that problem of manual provisioning processes going to a point-and-click, hands-free provisioning process. So they are all aspects of bringing software into the mix. But let me give you a little bit of color on each, each of these three. NV is really tailored towards the data center and tailored towards virtual machine mobility and creating domains or connecting domains across layer three boundaries. It's actually a very hard problem. Nacera started to crack that nut. That's why they got got such a high valuation and a nice exit last year through VMware. Uh, there's a lot of other new companies extrapolating and extending that functionality as well as VMware now in that race, companies such as PlumGrid and Embrane. Now, with network function virtualization, the idea here is I really want a service spun up on a flow. I have a service. I have a, for example, you and I are conversing over this video stream. Wouldn't it be nice if I could look into that video stream and do something like check uh, for uh, intrusion detection functionality or uh, have a firewalling function and I only want it to happen for a moment in time I only want to have it have it happen to a specific application flow well that's what the NFV people are trying to do by leveraging the high performance server platforms that are out there and then we have SDN SDN is really talking about a, a broader push where they're using open flow as a new protocol as a forwarding API to command and control your network from a central location or you're looking at other types of programmability to uh, manage your network from a specific or from a centralized environment. Uh, it's different in that it's not tailored to a specific function on a specific flow. It's more generic. The goal is, can't I centrally management manage different hardware devices, different vendors using a common framework? One person's CLI is different from another person's CLI. Uh, one uh, vendor's set of SNMP MIBs is different from another set of SNMP MIBs. So the pain point is when I change vendors in an operational environment, I have to retrain my technicians, I have to potentially rethink my CLI and my configs, and those cause fat finger events, and they also just cause a high increase in operational saving uh, costs when I'm actually trying to solve another problem, like bringing more bandwidth or bringing new features. So the idea of SDN really is if I abstract the control mechanisms from the vendor and from the hardware, I create a, uh, a more uniform operational framework that doesn't have to change every time I change the vendor. That's what OpenFlow hopes to do. Or when I change the hardware, which uh, abstracts you from the ASICs. Again, if you go back to what I said earlier in the PC industry, this happened through abstraction technology. Uh, and we're seeing lots of ideas on how to build abstraction into the network layer. Again, through uh, the, the consortium of the Open, Open Networking Foundation driving OpenFlow technology. Okay. Um, so what types of customers do you see as early adopters of this? Well, I think all three camps, SDN, NFV, and NV, guess what, are all uh, pretty much being attracted by the same customers because if you look at a data center with thousands of virtual machines as example one, today there's really no off-the-shelf solution that helps you move a virtual machine easily and consistently through auto automated tools from one data center to another or even within a large data center, there still are manual tasks. And so a lot of companies are in the race to crack that nut. And uh, so if you have a big data center and you have lots of virtual machines, you're going to be in line to talk to us. And in fact, uh, we, we are having lots of conversations with the following ver verticals. Cloud companies uh, obviously have that as a business model. So the more you can help them streamline their operations, that's margin directly back to their business. That means they can compete on price if they need to or report better margins to their shareholders, right? That's an obvious economic win. Uh, with service providers, 
uh, trying to manage circuits, it's the same story. They have thousands of circuits. They know how much a truck roll costs. They know how long it takes to provision a circuit, two, three, four weeks in some cases. They can lose a customer, Kelly, if you have to make them wait that long. The web is changing the game, and people are recognizing that a new service we all want, point, click, go. We don't want point, click, wait. And so, again, it, it attacks churn for the service provider. Churn is a huge cost, and it attacks the, uh, the, the speed at which you can de deploy a new service, which is just a great idea. We want a service immediately when we think about it. So, again, it gets back to margin. It gets back to lowering the cost of infrastructure so the carrier can compete on cost, or they can just report better margins back to their, their, uh, their shareholders. Uh, both the obvious uh, examples of these kinds of companies, again, are well-known telcos like Verizon and A. AT&T and NTT uh, in Japan. Uh, these are, uh, I'm not ex disclosing anything that's private here. Actually, if you go to the Open Networking Foundation, uh, you can see the companies that are sponsoring that work. Not only are those three companies sponsoring the work, but so are Google and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft. So you can kind of get the sense that the massive network people are first to see this pain and are first to key uh, to find a, a nice solution. And thankfully, uh, they have the pain because uh, there wouldn't be this this whole discussion topic. You and I would not be on the phone today doing this video call if this pain wasn't uh, not only real, uh, but people are trying to find a solution. The VC community, I think, has invested so far in new SDN companies around a half a billion dollars. And uh, we expect that investment to probably go to a billion after the end of next year when people go for their round B or round C financing. Um, I know you had a blog entry a, a few months ago about the severity of pain points as a driving factor for exploring SDN, and, and you just kind of touched on it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, at what point companies get to the to the point where, you know, something is, is really obstructing them to the point where they say, okay, we need to look at SDN to, to, to solve this? Well, it's, uh, it, it does depend on the size of the company, and it does depend on the vertical they're in, Kelly. And uh, the way people behave today is much different than in the late 90s when everything got money thrown at it and budgeting was kind of chaotic. Today, it's pragmatic. And companies still sit down annually and say, what are our top three problems? And they throw uh, budget allocations to those top three problems. The good news is uh, the problem set is being focused more today on operational savings. Five or ten years from now, we might be in a big capex cycle, but more and more customers are telling us, Steve, if you save us 10 or 20% on the, on the hardware, that's nice, but that's not the game changer. A data center organization will tell you that 70, 80, or 90% of their operational costs have to be dropped now for them to improve their margin footprint and for them to improve their business efficiency. It's not a capex savings. Capex on the data center for network, as an example, is less than 10%. So if you take the other piece, 70, 80, 90 percent of their operational budget is operations, holy cow, you can kind of get why OPEX reductions the new CAPEX. And so a lot of us are putting uh, marketing messages around how can we help you do things more through hands-off provisioning versus the manual tasks. And uh, uh, again, it's usually the bigger companies, but we are working with small companies also too. Uh, some of our customers are actually small regional service providers, hosting companies that uh, are looking for an economic advantage. Uh, imagine a team of 10 people serving a small city with their own hosting environment and their own IT services shop. Locally branded, uh, I'm actually talking about a live customer in Indianapolis, Indiana. I can't disclose their name just yet, but uh, think of a small shop catering to just Indianapolis. They chose to purchase our gear because we did save them CapEx initially, but we gave them the promise of helping that small four-person team have automated tools so they could change flows based on application characteristics. They could auto provision or update new software upgrades automatically through uh, a point and click hands free operation mindset versus having them dig in, tie into every device one by one with their laptop and make those changes one device by device. Very time consuming for a small person, four person team, right? <clears throat> on the service provider side, it's well known that a truck roll costs a minimum of $2,000 per day, per event. If you've got thousands of customers in a metro and they all want to get that new service that day, you just blew $200,000 just turning the service on. Well, that's an obvious attack from a CFO to say, isn't there a better way to do that? 
So this is why there's so much interest, interest in the word software. Software is the trigger because we all know that humans do a fantastic job. Here's the goal. What if we had a great network architect who knew the conditions the network would fail and knew the conditions that need to be met for certain application delivery models? Well, you build that into a set of policies. You put that policy idea of five policies, let's say, into your devices that respond to the conditions in the network. You can now make local decisions. That's part of the idea of SDN. You might have a centralized control model, but you also allow your regional devices or distributed devices to know their boundary conditions of when they can make a decision on their own. And we're working with a lot of great companies on how to do this and how to make sure that this is a true end-to-end -end system. Did that help answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, great. Um, one of the things that is another big trend right now is this move toward faster networks. You have wireless networks right. moving to LTE and to LTE Advanced. Right. You've got wireline networks moving, you know, 10 gig, 48 gig, 100 gig Ethernet, right. you know, and really amping up the speed. Um, so right. where does SDN factor in when you're talking about networks that are so much faster? Great answer. Great question, and I have three answers. First of all, as a consumer, I can assure you that my 4G LTE smartphone, I love it because I can push lots of video through my smartphone now. And that is a beautiful thing. Bandwidth solves a lot of problems for content delivery. However, <clears throat> I actually had a conversation with an analyst at the Open Networking Summit back in April. I ended up writing a blog about this because I was so perplexed by the confusion I saw in the market. Does bandwidth solve all problems? Well, it turns out it doesn't. Again, if you go back to the examples, does bandwidth solve how fast I can provision a virtual machine or change a network VLAN ID or, or, or spin up a new circuit, a new Metro Ethernet circuit. It really doesn't. If it's a 100 gigabit port with tons of bandwidth or a 1 megabit port, guess what? And by the way, I don't know if I can find a 1 megabit port out there, but you know, as an extreme example, we're talking about over 1,000 or in this case, 10,000 times more bandwidth. I still provision the circuit the same way, Kelly. So I haven't fixed anything in terms of service enablement and change management. Those are boring topics to a lot of people, but again, if it's an OPEX-focused world, making the applications faster, yes, bandwidth helps with the delivery of the content, but it doesn't help with changing the way the content's being delivered, and those are two separate problem sets. So if you go back to congestion control, simple latency based on too many packets going down a thin pipe, you know your smartphone wouldn't work so well on an old 3G network. But it doesn't fix the problem of how fast can I get that new service? And on the back end of, the, of, of people running around inside data center plants saying, uh oh, Kelly wants the new video stream. Someone run over there and change the cable real quick. Well, who wants to do that while we're eating our popcorn at home watching that video? We don't want to sit there and wait for the guy to move the cable. All right? We want it to happen right away. That's a provisioning problem. It's an operational management problem. Did that help clarify? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, how does PK8 address concerns about latency when it comes to software-defined networking? That's a concern that I hear fairly frequently, and I'm great. wondering you know, yeah. what your perspective on it is. Yeah. It's great. In fact, we had a third party do a test, uh, and, and it was kind of funny because I, I, I hate to... Uh, disenfranchise some of our competitors, but what the heck, you know, we, uh, it, it was done by a group, it's actually published on uh, Silicon IT, and uh, our Silicon Angle, and uh, long story short, they asked seven vendors to show up to do the test, only two of us did, uh, we were s about 3x faster than the other competitor, and you can go read that report for yourself and figure out who, who was brave to show up, but they didn't do so well, and so there is an issue with late I mean, it, it's kind of obvious, right? If you have now centralized your control mechanisms, there has to be a communication flow to all your distributed devices. So innately, first level, I go, wait, I have the speed of light limitation now, and if I have devices in Chicago and I'm in New York, I have a 50 millisecond round trip. Is that too long? Well, it can be in certain conditions if you add up multiple decisions and you start to cascade into seconds. And then we're starting to get worried about the TCP IP 30 second uh, SYNAC gap, right? So there, the concern is real. However, there's a lot of great work being done by NTT in particular. They're the most public about what they're doing, and so I think there's other companies doing fantastic work as well as ourselves, but we are partnered with NTT on solving this problem. And basically the idea is this. It gets back to my policy idea table. People are pretty smart, Kelly, and when they design networks, they know the three or four or ten things that can go right or wrong in that network position 
due to the services that they plan to roll out. So you can build a database within the device that has conditions and it has uh, metering to establish whether those conditions are being met or not. And basically the idea of SDN is to not just have all decisions be made centrally, it's to allow the distributed devices to have a certain amount of local intelligence. So if it's a simple problem, yes, this port's having high latency, can I just flip over to an adjacent port or to an adjacent flow? Sure, go ahead and do that. And then report that decision that has been made back to the central controller so that the state of all these decisions is maintained. But we wouldn't want the central controller to be sent the query, can I change this port now, wait 10, 40, 100 milliseconds for the answer yes, right? You want to have certain things done regionally or in a distributed manner. And the good news is people are thinking this through. And if you're deep into SDN today, I assure you vendors will come in and show you that there's real stuff being done. You can see these in demonstrations. And uh, I think that problem will be alleviated very quickly. Um, other than latency, do you think there are other barriers to adoption of SDN at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's the same old adoption problem when you have any new technology, right? Let's look at voice over IP. In the enterprise, how long have we had voice over IP? Well over a decade, yet we're still only 30% penetrated. 10, 10 gig has been around, oh my gosh, uh, over a decade. We're we're just starting to see the ramp in 10 gig E throughout the enterprise and throughout the service provider network, right? In the core, shoot, we're at 100 gig already, but I'm talking about the edges, right? So every trend takes far longer to, to adopt than any network vendor ever wants. It's, uh, it's good for the media, though, because you guys have something to talk about, and it's fun for the readers because they get to laugh at all of us vendors saying, oh, come on now, I don't want to do that just yet. So this is going to be a long trend. This is going to take five to ten years, okay? Let's just be honest. Don't short F5 and Cisco just yet. They've got a long way to go before the revenue gets cannibalized. However, what's different about the market today because everybody's whitewashed their house and everybody overnight's become an SDN vendor, customers are, are confused and they've changed the game. I'll tell you an example. Uh, we now get to meet with very senior executives and very large companies. And why is that interesting? Well, in my former days at Force 10 or Riverstone or even Infoblox, we would rarely meet the VP of architecture or his boss or her boss, the EVP of network infrastructure or global services, infrastructure services. If we had a big PO, we might sit with them and say, hi, nice to meet you. Thanks for qualifying us. We're going we're to treat you right and show you, show you we're a great partner. But that would be it. Now, because of SDN, there are entourages of executives who come through Silicon Valley and meet 20 to 30 companies a week. I'm not exaggerating because they're trying to figure out what's on the horizon. Is this a 2014 plan for me? Is it a 2015 or is it a 2020 plan? So we have very, very high visibility into large organizations. That changes the sales strategy. That changes the adoption curve. And it also really is why I think some of the companies have whitewashed their messaging because they see this as, uh-oh, this isn't just some small company knocking on the door with the lowest person on the totem pole off in the corner lab playing around in a sandbox. Executives are very concerned about what the market is doing and they don't want to miss an opportunity to change a competitive advantage for their company. So long story short, we're on a long ride here, but we are getting much different visibility into organizations than I've ever seen before in my 27 years in Silicon Valley. I'm not sure that answers your question, but I think it's a very important point for people to understand that if you have pain on the operational side and you're looking for new tricks, hey, don't just talk to your legacy vendor. Talk to some of the new guys. We do have interesting ideas. Um, no, that's interesting because you know one of the stories that I worked on this week was Nokia Siemens uh, testing Volte with a virtualized mm -hmm. network core environment. Um, right. I'm wondering if there are other uh, news stories or you know just trends that you've become aware of in the past you know six months to a year or so that you think kind of illustrate um, you know the direction that the market is going. Yeah, I think I think the VMware acquisition and the Sarah really was the cascade or the catalyst that started the next phase. And when you have a high valuation for a company like Nasera that had barely uh, $2 million in real revenue, maybe deferred revenue, uh, you know, rumors were upwards of $20 million, but long story short, they didn't have a lot of customers. They didn't have a lot of revenue. So why would someone pay $1.2 billion for that? Well, I think it's the dynamic that's been occurring for 10 years, Kelly. This is, the funny thing about SDN is it's really been going on for a long time. 
right? The idea of uh, an, an incumbent like VMware buying a new technology, that's not a no, new idea, right? Juniper bought Contrail. They needed better provisioning uh, technology for MPLS and needed a controller story. Cisco's buying cloud management shops left and right every three or four weeks, right? So all these are really about the same trend. We're all trying to solve two problems at the same time. One, how do I make sure that the network is part of an overall provisioning ecosystem, right? Servers, done. Virtual machines, done. Storage, close. Network, oop, we got a ways to go there. That's the slow pole in the stack. We all know it takes weeks or days, sometimes months, to reprovision aspects of the network. Other parts of the silos, I just went through that. We know it's faster and it's way ahead. So that's part of the reason we're all running around trying to figure out, do I need to beef up my portfolio by acquiring a small company? Do I need to invent myself as a new company and say there's a new hole in the industry that I can uniquely fill? This is why it's so challenging. I've never seen this before in my career. When 10 gig came out, as an example, when I was at Force 10, the big guys didn't care. They waited for it to reach 40 or 50 million a quarter before they even jumped into the game. But that's not happening now. When voice over IP came out, the big guys didn't offer it. You know, they were fighting to save their, P, uh, their, their PSTN or you know, IP PBX at best or old PBX business and saying, no, 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 this VoIP stuff is not going to save you any money. It's not going to be stable. But companies like Shortel showed, guess what? There's a real market out there, right? And they challenged the incumbents. So. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of things going on. We admit the confusion is difficult for people to deal with. And so, again, I thank you for having us here because I hope our conversation is giving people some ideas. The main guidance I can give is, one, if you're looking at your legacy and vendor, uh, vendor, ask them some quite tough questions on when they changed that data sheet. Was it just a word? Did they really roll out some new functionality? <laughs> Number two, when you're talking to a, a focused company like PK with a lot of new ideas, we like to partner up. We're not trying to sell to everybody right now. We're not in a transactional business model where everybody I call has the same pain point. We are inventing, and uh, we're having a lot of fun inventing, and we're really trying to work with people who understand that the pain is excessive, their existing vendors aren't solving the problem, and we go and do a pilot. We do a, we do a lab study, and we look at what we can do to help with that problem because it's, uh, it's still early days in defining the use cases. I can go through a few use cases if you, if you think we have time to do that. You know, actually, I wanted to end with uh, with a different question. Okay. Uh, and that was, you know, you've kind of, you know, laid out a timeline where SDN, in one form or another, has been going on for a while. Yeah. And then that this is part of a long road. So yeah. I'm kind of wondering, you know, let's let's look at what maybe the next step is and where we might be. I, I'm curious as to where you see the market in, the, say, mm -hmm. three to five years as opposed to ten years. Well, oh, boy. Wow. I get to have the big picture here. So... I think the most important thing is the economics of networking are going to change dramatically. You're going to see a lot more adoption of the white box model. Whether you buy the switch from the ODM, the original design manufacturer in Taiwan with its embedded operating system or you put your own on just like you do with the Linux or Microsoft in your server environment, we see companies pushing both models and, and that's going to flush out. But the bottom line is more and more people are going to adopt white box technology. It's stable. It's lower cost you have the flexibility to choose. You don't have to wait for your vendor to roll out 10G base T. You can go buy a 10G base T box yourself and put the operating system of choice on it. So that level of freedom and cost savings we think is going to happen because it's already happened with servers. It's already happening with storage. It's just a no-brainer. People get it. They save money. On the software triggering the software aspect of management, provisioning, and operations, I think network virtualization is really the first beachhead. Why? Because everybody, including VMware, agreed that they didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle. They needed to go out and acquire it. And so the, now there's a race for others in the space, as well as VMware, to build on that idea and not just have point-and-click provisioning of a virtual machine lifecycle exist within a very uh, com confined, small, defined area on your rack, but actually be able to move a VM from anywhere to anywhere on the planet and have total control. That might sound cool, and gee, I can't wait for it to happen, but trust me, it's a really hard problem. It's going to take time. But I do believe there's so much interest in NV, and enterprises have adopted uh, virtual technology so much, including cloud providers, that we all want that hybrid cloud model. I want to move assets back and forth between public and private clouds seamlessly with a click of a mouse. That's network virtualization. That's going to help drive that one faster, better, cheaper. NFV is emerging. 
uh, and I think there's some great stories out there and there's some great capability out there, but it does break the mold of having an isolated box uh, do that function into a, some amorphous server that you spin up services on the fly. So it's going to be uh, very s a very small set of use cases initially with a very small set of customers who believe in that, but we already know there's trials going on with some of our, our friends in the space, and we know that there's a lot of excitement to make that model work. I just put that as a, as a parallel but secondary one. OpenFlow, uh, I think we're going to surprise some people, Kelly. I know this year, uh, a little bit of hint here, and I'd love to get you back on the phone when we announce it. We're going to announce real production OpenFlow-based data centers in the fall. So we already know that there are data center providers who see OpenFlow as a better way to provision and manage certain flows and uh, they've convinced themselves that that technology is not only ready for, for production, but it actually brings new capability uh, that layer two and layer three protocol stacks couldn't do by themselves. Okay. Great. Well, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. We've been talking with Steve Garrison, Vice President of Product Management at Pika 8. Steve, thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Again, great to be here on Hangout today. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.